Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing great. Uh, it's so lovely to see you all and, and to be back. Uh, sorry if the audio is a little bit dodgy for a couple of you. We're trying out new things. So if that didn't come through quite right, then we'll sort it out for next week uh, for sure. Uh, right. It's so lovely to see you all. Thank you all. Uh, I can see folks popping in where they're watching from. Uh, uh, we've got folks in Munich and Cardiff, uh, Dortmund, Warwickshire, Derby, Glasgow. Uh, that's ridiculous. Uh, it's so lovely to see you all. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, today, I want to kick off 2024 in the same way as we do with most of our sessions, with asking you for two things. Uh, the first is especially uh, relevant for today's session, it being all about social media. So if you have uh, anything to take from today's session, your biggest takeaway, uh, please do share it on social media. That's the type of thing which helps the conversation go after today's session. That's also the type of thing uh, which helps build this community up and up. Uh, the second thing is just keep that chat feature buzzing. I mean, I can see so many lovely folks uh, popping in from, uh, we've got Pauline, Anna, Chelsea, uh, Lauren, Jessica, uh, Becky. Uh, thank you all so much for taking the time. Um, if you haven't already, uh, don't forget to switch your chat feature to everyone so everyone can see your messages, not just hosts and panelists. I can see almost like a doubling of the amount of comments coming through uh, right now just to host and panelists only. So make sure to switch your toggle to everyone so you can see that that's found in the chat feature. If that sounds good, let's get introducing our guest. So today we have Sophie Miller, who is the founder of Pretty Little Marketer. Um, Sophie's like just evidence that the world needs, uh, that the world needs that nice folk don't finish last. Uh, she is kind beyond belief hugely successful and she's one of those people that we just absolutely cheer from the sidelines uh marveling at her efforts uh often thinking how is she doing that because like <laughs> the velocity of pretty little marketer over these past few years has been phenomenal to see and it's just so gratifying uh to have a good people person behind it too so yeah today's one of those days which is really exciting um i hope you'll get an awful lot from it uh, today will function as a pure Q&A, uh, so we're going to be taking some questions from me at the beginning, just to make sure we deliver on the promise of today's session with the title, but then we're going to be making sure that we take questions from you as well. Um, so if you would like to ask Sophie anything, uh, make sure to use the Q&A feature, which is found in sort of like the toolbar down the bottom, get your questions in, and if you see any questions that you like, give it a thumbs up, that will make sure that I prioritise it as we ask them. Right, I'm going to try something else fancy right now, because before we get going, I need to say a big, big, big thank you to our sponsors. Uh, and this week's featured sponsor, -da, it actually worked, I think, uh, is Exclaimer. So I love Exclaimer because it speaks to uh, the little things, getting the little things right, uh, which is all about uh, Exclaimer, help you optimize your email signatures and do it across your company. They standardize it. Now, I don't know if any of you ever tried to standardize your email signatures for a company even like of 10 people, it's blooming difficult. And so Exclaimer help you with that. They also help you turn your email signature into a marketing channel with uh, some nifty little features, which I really like. And they're giving a the 20% discount code uh, to the marketing meetup community. Uh, so do take the time to check out Exclaimer. I'll put the uh, instructions on how to get 20% off in the follow-up email. Also, uh, a big thank you to our other sponsors. Uh, we've got Frontify, uh, Clavio, Redgate, uh, Cambridge Marketing College, and maybe you one day. Uh, if you'd like to sponsor the Marketing Meetup, get in front of our lovely folks, uh, please do get in touch. With all that said, uh, let's get going with today's session with another lovely transition. And Sophie, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's a joy as ever. And let's get going with a question about the current landscape and ask you, uh, what are the top three social media platforms you're prioritizing for marketers in 2024 and why? 
Oh, I am so excited to <laughs> be here today. I feel like I've just been on like a trend and forecasting train since the yeah. start of December. It's always that time of year, isn't it, where every company on the planet launches their like yearly wrap. It's the trend report, it's YouTube playback, and I've essentially been eating it all up <laughs> for the past <laughs> six weeks now um so excited to finally let some of the information out of my brain um absolutely love this community as well so a joy uh, pure joy to be here so for me there are two platforms that i'm really thinking about this year there are two that i feel my business or me as a marketer have humbly conquered, but I, I recommend them too. So I'll whiz through them quickly. And number one, very common answer that you'll see people talk about this year is YouTube. There's a lot of chatter on the internet about long form being back. I really don't think for the people who are in loyal communities that long form content went anywhere to begin with but TikTok short form video YouTube shorts almost was a louder conversation so long form was forgotten about I am um, I've actually got my camera it's just switched itself off but I'm vlogging this week in attempt to live my trend forecast out and give YouTube a shot for myself I know that you guys place a lot of your kind of webinars on YouTube as well. And I really feel like it's going to resod this year, or at least I hope it will, because I personally want it to. <laughs> nice. I find that really interesting. Why is that? What What is it about long form in particular that um, sort of feels interesting this year? Um, or what is the chatter about? Because Oh, good that. question. Yeah, I see a lot of people, specifically on TikTok, talking about how people are bored of TikTok. I feel like we are slowly moving past the conversation of attention spans have shrunk, but actually attention spans are just pickier. We, as consumers, I really think we've become aware of where we're placing our time and effort. So a really interesting TikTok from someone I follow called Coco Moco, which is vastly the coolest name ever. <laughs> And um, she explored a similar topic around long form coming back and why she thinks that it's going to be such a big thing this year. And um, this thought of it actually takes more effort for you as a consumer, a social media user, to scroll to a new video on TikTok every 10 seconds to adapt to a new face, a new voice, a new landscape, a new topic, a new community. Doing that for 10 minutes, you're digesting so much more than you would be than if you sat down, watched a vlog from your favorite marketer, at printed marketer on YouTube. <laughs> um, it takes much less effort and that conversation around attention span shrinking, I don't think they, well, scientifically, they probably have shrunk, but marketing wise, I think we're just becoming more aware of, again, where our energy is going. So I really loved, and I thought that point was so interesting about, although TikTok, you scroll, you get to see so much, actually the effort it takes to digest every 10, 20 seconds, something new is huge. Um, so replacing that with something more dedicated, something slower, I suppose. I think I'm really interested to see, I'm gonna try it myself, but yeah, interested to see how that one will go. It's really interesting. And it probably speaks to a bit of a trend in, in lifestyles as well, which is you just hear so many folks sort of speaking about not making this the year of, I mean, we did this before uh, we went live where we were just speaking about not making this the biggest year ever. Yeah. You know, we were speaking about, you know, getting through the year in a sustainable, lovely, you know, sort of way, which sort of balances out uh, both life and, and, and everything else, um, which is really really interesting i guess there's also a point there about active viewing versus passive viewing yeah like i always put youtube on in the background uh when i'm cooking for example um mm -hmm. but and you know i'd happily watch something really interesting from i don't know uncensored cmo or something like that um so that's really interesting um you mentioned a uh in fact could i just follow up on this because there is a couple in the chat um so uh how how long is long form to you uh when folks mm -hmm. say I feel like everyone you speak to would probably give a different answer. So I'd also be curious to know what you think, Joe. I would say, how long is long form to me? Video-wise, I would say three minutes plus. That okay. would be 
what do you think yeah I, I, i'm probably there as well you know it's yeah. it's um beyond what you would comfortably post on social media yeah. usually you know or expect mm -hmm. people to sort of scroll past uh so we've got uh amy though in the chat sort of in 10 minutes book there sort of saying 15 to 30 so maybe you got sort of long form and then you got long long form maybe Extra um, long form. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so that's really interesting um you spoke about your second channel that you were thinking about as well um so uh, what was the second platform that you're prioritizing for this year yeah so although starting thinking of youtube and long form and for me youtube's going to be that very evergreen space it's the place that i'm probably not going to be posting on all the time but it's for the really loyal brand fans who are invested in my business and our community and I guess like the polar opposite side to that is giving TikTok a proper run for its money this year. It was my, it's really embarrassing, it was my 2020 New Year's, 2022 New Year's resolution to post on TikTok every day of the year. And um, well, <laughs> we're in 2024 now, I don't think I post very often at all. Um, but I really want my TikTok experience as a marketer to just be a place where I experiment. See. I was really lucky to grab 20 minutes with someone called Anna from Sisters and Seekers, who are a UK-based clothing brand. They've just hit 100,000 followers on TikTok this week, actually, and I interviewed her last week. Um, just learning more about their approach to TikToks, I think that they are an incredible example of how to do it well. And throughout every conversation, I was reading the transcription last night, ready to type up the interview, even for a company like theirs. Their TikTok approach is simply to experiment. So for me, looking at TikTok this year, less as a place to go viral, grow my audience, get leads, although all of those are, of course, possible over there, really using it as a channel to experiment have fun try new things because if no one sees it it's fine also but if people do see it then those are some really good insights that could potentially travel i feel like tiktok just runs the world in terms of trends and conversations as well so figuring out how you or for me my brand could be a part of that i think is going to be yeah a really good learning curve hopefully anyway nice i love that and, and it feels really important i mean so what would you say is your so first thing we need to say is that before we came on today, we we sort of spoke about the difficulty in, in sort of speaking about these trends, because like there's going to be so many people in so many different contexts that we definitely have to frame today as like, this is Sophie's reflections on what's going on in the social media landscape and, and the things that you're thinking of rather than generic business advice uh, yeah. that, you know, everyone take into their into their business every day. Um, nonetheless, when you're sort of speaking about experimentation, for you at the very least, if you're not thinking about going viral, mm -hmm. what are you thinking about on TikTok? That is, is it the experimentation just to see what works and then you double down on that? Or are you sort of thinking about something else? W what's the direction of that experimentation? Awesome. Yeah, two things. I think number one is that experimenting on like topics and trends and me as a marketer, you know, it was um, the Grammys last week. I know it was the Emmys last night and I am really into pop culture and I think as marketers, as brands, we should be pop culture literally one runs our world. It's the memes we see on TikTok, on Twitter, it influences what people or de-influences what people buy, the sports games people go to, i.e. Taylor Swift and where she is and what she's up to. Um, so for me, number one, figuring out kind of like where I fit in that and how I can use the power of TikTok in terms of those conversations and trends to build my business in the right way um and then two something I, I know a lot of people are talking about this this year is of course personal branding which we all know is nothing new personal branding has been around forever but I suppose with the power of the internet now it just looks different mm -hmm. I um often recommend and I know others do too LinkedIn for your personal brand building in a professional sense is or has been for me an incredible place to get in front of new people to position my business. I always call it proper, but with authority and hopefully some credibility too. 
but I think video and I know that people have done this long before I've been thinking about it video almost gives that personal brand that extra depth so that when you're thinking about PLM, for example, you can hear what PLM and see what PLM sounds like as opposed to just copy on your noisy LinkedIn feed. So twofold, I suppose. Number one, figuring out where I fit in that trend cycle and how I can leverage that for my business, as again, many others have done before. But two, almost giving, I guess, giving my brand dimension through TikTok and deepening it a little more. Um, of course, many, many ways to use TikTok this year, but those are the two main ones for me. Nice. I love that. And and what you're speaking about as well is also mirrored through different elements of marketing as well. So um, we've previously had Grace Kite, Dr. Grace Kite, and I think it was a Zeme in our SEO um, panel that we held at, at late year. Both of them were recommending video as, as the go-to sort of format in terms of the thing that people should be really, really thinking about. Yeah. Um, so that is really interesting that it's just been mirrored across um, mm -hmm. different elements from within the sort of marketing sphere. So um, there's a real encouragement there. And of course, the Sandbrook in the chat right now saying, yup, in capital letters, uh, who's always been convinced of the power of video. Um, mm -hmm. So that's uh, really, really important. Um, Cool. I can see that we've got 23 open questions right now. There's also been a bunch that have come through uh, the, the the chat feature. If I could just ask folks to uh, pop questions in the Q&A and make sure that any you would really like asked are given a thumbs up, then we'll make sure to prioritize those in the second half of today's session um, in sort of the next 10 to 12 minutes or so. Um, but let's continue because uh, I want to make sure that we, as I say, deliver on the promise of what we asked uh, at the beginning of today's session. So um, when we're speaking about emerging trends, this is quite a difficult thing um, because, you know, trends will emerge as the year goes on. Mm -hmm. But can you identify anything at the moment where you're like, you know what, this is probably going to be something in the next year that marketers should be aware of uh, trend wise? Absolutely. So I have got a tiny list with me. So I've got three that I am really thinking about, not just for myself, but for my clients as well. So I consult with B2B and B2C brands on how they can use social media. Now, my focus and my outlook, my perspective on socials is very community focused. So a lot of these are going to be based in my bias of social media as a relationship tool. If you are interested in having like a deeper dive into, I guess, more data backed um, emerging trends, HubSpot, Hootsuite, SEMrush all have great free reports that you can likely find on the Internet too. Amazing. So number one is something that I shared on LinkedIn on the PLM channel a few weeks back that got a lot of people talking in the comments, actually, and it is this sort of employees as influencers and if you're live in the chat I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well because it's a conversation that I'm really interested in so when I talk about employees as influencers there are kind of two strands to it number one is that more b2c influencing if any of you have seen sheer lux on tiktok or i guess a more recent example loosely might be ben gallagher from lux collective and how they almost as employees become the faces of their brands there's a um, beautiful girl in the Lux, uh, Shia Lux team called Sapna. And I always hope I say her name correctly. And um, she's on the Shia Lux. Nope, she's on, yeah, it is Shia Lux. TikTok channel, she's on their Instagram. She does like her product roundups on stories. But I love her recommendation so much through the company page that I've gone on to find her personal Instagram. I follow her, she influences, she does brand deals through there. So I think that's going to be a really interesting dynamic there in the B2C space specifically. The way I see that looking for B2B is probably leveraging more LinkedIn, maybe TikTok, and creating thought leaders in your company. I think that Born Social do a good job at this on LinkedIn and TikTok. Um, Clout, Amelia Sordell's brand, a lot of her employees post about personal branding, their wins, their client wins, and less influencing, I suppose. But again, using those as, in my post, I call them community connectors. So it's like brand people, but you've got your employees in the middle, almost helping people up onto that platform. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't know how it's going to play out, whether that's going to be something we look back on in five years and think, God, we explored <laughs> all, all of our employees. That was awful. Or whether it'll be like hugely innovative and great. So number one, and I really love these thoughts in the chat as well. It's that thought of employees as influencers and how that could play out. That's fabulous. Um, like, uh, there's a lot of agreement in the chat here, and 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 uh, folks really are agreeing with the importance of it. Um, I'd I'd love to carry on to number two if if you want. Awesome. Mind. Yes, of course. Number two, I guess less. It's not anything new, but I think it's something that a lot of brands are going to prioritize more this year. It was Paula Perez. I think that is their name. They are a community manager at Oatly. I followed them on. LinkedIn and they did a post early December and it was screenshots from them being cheeky from the Oatly TikTok account and replying to people. And um, obviously they are in industry, they are running a, a huge account and I'm really loving seeing bigger brands note the importance of not just building relationship, you know, being relatable, building your personal brand, being unhinged or whatever it might be but actually taking it from like, this is our funny content that you enjoy. Here's you commenting and connecting with them through their comment sections. Again, I think attention span isn't shrinking. We're just becoming fussier and just being relatable through our content. I'm not sure it's enough anymore when our attention is being fought for all day, every day. Um, again, I spoke with Anna from Sisters and Seekers about this, and she says that she loves replying to comments because it positions them as a friend. It's just someone in the group chat, it's someone replying to them and rewarding that engagement as well. I um, remember I did a post on LinkedIn a while back about Monzo, who are just, they rock marketing. And um, whoever, I don't know if it's Richard Cook who manages the LinkedIn or whoever it is that manages the LinkedIn commented, and it was something funny. And I remember screenshotting it. It's almost like a badge of honor of like Monzo commented on my account. They've seen it. This is awesome. So really interested to see like who does that better this year and who's going to prioritize that as well. Um yes. I love that. Just to just to jump in there, I, I think it's a really fabulous point and, and one that would work in a range of contexts as well. Um, because I think some folks would sort of say uh Monzo is a type of company where you do get that badge of honor. But yeah. if you're a, an engineering firm uh in Cambridge, you know, and, and that's highly relevant to you and your world, um it, it works in exactly the same way. And I think there'll be a temptation for some folks to go, Oh, my company's not as interesting as Monzo, mm -hmm. but um, I, I think uh, it, that point is just one that's really well to be reinforced for, for everyone to sort of engage yeah. with you. Absolutely. One of my challenges this year is to, especially through the PLM channels, try and reply, not always, but try my best to reply to every comment. So oh. you're not just brand person, it's like a, it's a shared space. And um, my third and final kind of prediction for this year is something similar. Obviously, the use of AI is oh, all people are talking about now. It's like a big trend prediction for this year. It was last year as well and probably will be next year. But AI and the conversation around that trend speaks to be more in a how can I be different and unique way as opposed to, I don't know, how can I get GPT to write my captions or whatnot? And something I'm really thinking about this year. And I guess it ties in with those two other predictions as well. And my love for community building and relationship is that immersive experience that brands are creating online. So again, whether it's Oakley or our engineering firm in Cambridge replying to their comments, it's like opening the door to their workshop and being in there with them. I think it's one of the reasons why people are talking so much about authenticity at the moment as well. It's more than being relatable or showing behind the scenes. It's that immersive, inviting the outside in almost and getting to know brands and allowing your audience to know you as more than just an engineering firm. But here's the person at the front desk. Here's the person doing X, Y, Z. Here are our values. Here's where we came from. Um, so use of AI trend leading into that thought of that experimental experience online community vibes buzzwords 
<laughs> I love it. But I also, the thing that I, I appreciate about that last point in particular is that it loops back around with the, the longer form content as well, you know, yeah. because uh-huh. you're doing both, you're doing both those things. So Absolutely. everything ties up really, really, um, really, really well uh, together. Um, I could see that um, on the first point where you were sort of mentioning um, uh, employees as advocates, there were some uh, comments in the chat about um, folks being worried about uh, their employees not necessarily wanting to appear on camera and stuff like that. Uh, what I'll do after today's session, because we probably don't have a lot of time to go into that today, is I'll link a session that we did last year uh, in the follow-up email, uh, which I think will hopefully help folks uh, with a little bit of that as well. Um, so watch out for that uh, in there. Um, I want to make sure, I, I had 12 questions before we get going. I think we've covered two, uh, which is amazing because of the depth of your answer. So um, I really appreciate it. And, and it's been fabulous to um, to explore all of these. Um, I want to focus perhaps a little bit on gaining initial traction because I saw that you um, did a post the other day about what happens if no one's commenting. And so yeah. one of your themes uh, that you just sort of spoke about with your predictions was uh, really engaging back, but perhaps if you're not getting anything back, then that's really tricky. Uh, I saw Hannah in the chat, for example, speaking about try doing it if you're a digital marketing agency, for example, where people don't want to hear from you. So for brands or marketers just starting out on these platforms or folks who aren't presently seeing much traction, what are you? What strategies would you recommend uh, to gain traction and sort of really start building that audience? Or is that the wrong way to be thinking about it? Perhaps it's... Oh, yeah. good question. I think it's like it almost becomes taboo sometimes, doesn't it? To talk about growth. And even I was writing a post the other day and I wrote the word followers and I was like, oh, no, that should be audience or that should be community. But actually wanting a larger audience or just having a 2024 goal to grow your followers isn't a bad thing. I, I think that we're often really condemned for it, aren't we? I am hugely passionate about growth. I have days of the week where I post things purely. I love community and building relationship, but I have days of the week specifically on the LinkedIn PLM channel where I will post a meme or a trending post or something purely for growth because I want to grow my community. Mm. Um, Ultimately, you cannot grow if you're not getting in front of new people. And it sucks when you create something that is so relationship building. It's an awesome carousel. It's full of value, but no one sees it because they're not there yet. And it's almost like you're, think of yourself as as a singer or an artist. And, you know, if you rocked up to the O2 in London and just walked onto the stage and started singing, that's great. But I think the walls are padded and no one can hear you yet. And if you haven't taken that time before to introduce yourself to the world, no one knows you're there and you can't fill all the seats. So step one for me is figuring out how can you get in front of the most right people. I guess the step before that would be, of course, to optimize your social channel so that when you do get in front of those people, your bio is good, your link in bio is good, your story highlights are set up and whatnot. But in terms of content and growth, step one for me is always, what can I do on this platform? What is your chosen platform? What can I do to get in front of the most right people? Um, I have a post on my Instagram grid somewhere all about shareable content and the reason why people share content is it either resonates with a belief or an interest. It's something we believe that represents us. Maybe it's why does my boss not understand social media? We might want to share it because it's what we believe or it's an interest such as something trendy about the Barbie movie or Oppenheimer or whatever's trendy right now. Using a belief or interest, a meme, a trending post, something shareable that's going to expand your reach. You need to be visible before people kind of connect and follow. But there's a trillion other more things I could say, but I will send those posts and maybe they can be linked somewhere because I feel like they go more in depth on like connection points. But yeah, ultimately, what can I do to get in front of the most right people right now and almost viewing that initial growth stage as again something exciting to experiment with rather than I need to grow I need people to see my content you have no pressure right now because there's no one there yet so you can (laughs) sing 
the fourth song you wrote to the empty O2 and have a good time. So yeah, initial thought, what can you do to get in front of the most bright people on the platforms you're on? I love that. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I, I, two two things to to follow up with that. First is a logistical point because we're going to be sort of heading into the community questions uh, in a moment. So, folks, if you see any questions that you like, make sure to give them a thumbs up because we'll prioritise those, and that will help us keep us honest on whether we've delivered on the session that you want it to be. Um, so, make sure to prioritise uh, those things. I think Sophie's already already given some phenomenal answers uh, today with some great examples too. So, it's it's been fab. Um, the second is um, on that growth point. Um, I maybe this is a, a generational thing, so um, but I think there's like a, a pride it almost in that sort of. Uh, I always want to provide that depth of content, and it's almost yeah. at the expense of uh, posting memes and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I, um, I think I've almost been proud to a point of uh, blocking our growth. Because, you know, we've done well with TMM, but if we posted memes, for example, or, or slightly more, uh, if I was going to be uh, rude about it, probably like thinner content, yeah. you know, then, uh -huh. then, then, you know, like I've been worried about that. Um, so I'm really interested about that point about sort of posting those things and stuff like that. Is that something that you've had a mental block on at any point or, you know, felt like it's not represented your companies or do you just feel it's such an important part of social strategy that, we have to get over that and, and sort of work through that point. I love this question. I think for a really long time when people mentioned shareable content to me, memes were the only thing I thought of. So again, recognizing that people share a belief or an interest, I feel like gave me a opening as to actually what could that shareable content be that isn't just a meme um I also the way I build my social strategy with my platforms and my content strategy is using a different platform for a different goal and so LinkedIn for me I find really e easy easier than other platforms for organic growth and visibility my personal account um specifically so I will use that account to maybe share my more general content the content that are smaller tips for everybody in the marketing space it might be a meme it might be a trending piece it might be an encouragement people love to share encouragement things that make you feel good but I will use that platform to hopefully grow, increase my brand's visibility. But then in every post, I will always mention PLM or I will link or I will tag PLM in the comment section. So whether it's shareable content that isn't necessarily memes and figuring out what that could look like for your brand or using your platform strategically. So maybe TikTok is the place where you share your thin content that gets you in front of the most right people, but you always refer back to your LinkedIn. So people then are sent there and that's where you build your depth of relationship. Or for me, that looks like doing so my thinner content on LinkedIn, but then my more in-depth community carousels, the valuable content on my Instagram. So visibility will look different again it's tricky isn't it? it will look different to everybody but yeah whether that is through your content or through the channels you use increasing your visibility and then pulling those people back wherever you might want them to be instagram newsletter tiktok wherever that's perfect you know speaking about marketing concepts is is a good old funnel in a way you know to yeah, an extent, exactly that. everything having a purpose so Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate that answer because I, I think even that just helps me get past my own mental block as much as anything else. So um, thank you. Um, let's start taking questions from the community. We've got 25 minutes left, uh, 54 uh, open questions. Uh, so we'll do our best to both get through what we can, but also make sure the depth of the conversation uh, is, is appropriate. So the first one is from Dale. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read it slowly, uh, Sophie. So you've got time to uh, to 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 think about the answer. Uh, you've already mentioned one, I think, today. Um, but which B two B companies do you think are smashing uh, TikTok right now? Ooh, good question. I think two come to mind initially. Um, number one would be more. Is it Morning Brew or Marketing Brew? What's like the big company? I think it's Morning Brew. Morning Brew. Yeah. niche brews underneath morning brew i would consider them to be 
B2B? And I, yeah, I guess so. If you're not familiar with Morning Brew, oh, how would you describe them? I guess they're like a, a new outlet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I publish a, yeah. a news outlet, but yeah. it's targeted businesses. So they're awesome. They have uh, a great newsletter if you're interested. First of all, it's free. <laughs> I think through every day as well. But on the TikTok piece, Morning Brew, they have the best TikTok channel. It was Rachel Carl Carton Carton who runs a newsletter called I think it's Lincoln bio if not i'll send it to you joe and we can recommend it yeah. um she actually interviewed the social media manager from morning brew so if you haven't checked them out i highly recommend they almost like dramatize and make light of news with the end goal of like entertaining people and delivering the news that is the whole goal of the business that's what they do but the way that differs from their Instagram where it's just a news story to their newsletter where it's a bit more built out to their TikTok where it's entertainment value. I think it's really interesting when you look at their social channels to see they do the same thing, but how they do it in those places is really different. So Morning Brew would absolutely be number one. And then number two, again, I'm not sure if we consider them to be B2B. I definitely do would be Adobe. Um, they do really awesome content with their UGC content. And despite it being a tool and a software, all of their videos have a person in, have a human in, which feels really backwards. But I, again, goes back to that thought of one, employees as influencers, or not even just employees, but like the faces of your brands and how you can build relationship that way. Um, I'd say they're quite polar opposite, Adobe and Morning Brew, but those would be my two, my two favorites. But if anyone else has any faves, please pop them in the chat because I would love to know. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a great call out as well, actually. Thank you, and, and thank you for those two. I, I think that that works perfectly because they're two very different companies. Um, yeah, definitely. Go go in very different ways. So thank you. Um, let's take the next one, uh, which comes from uh, an anonymous attendee. Um, they're always mysterious. In fact, mm -hmm. almost all of the top questions today are from anonymous. So <laughs> um, someone's asking very good questions, or or these are different folks. Um, but um, the question is where we have an audience on a social media channel that's become a bit stagnant uh, how can we best re-engage these folks really good question it is the worst feeling sometimes isn't it i um i've lost my mouse there we go i worked with a brand two years ago it's quite a while ago now and they used to have a thriving uh, linkedin company page and their engagement used to be great it used to result in some really high quality applications and recommendations and then their social media person left it was left to another team they didn't have time because when you already have a job social media is a job in itself and it wasn't used for around a year audience wise you forget you fall out of love you're engaging with other people so they become up at the top of your home pages over people that aren't posting started posting again and nothing all of the old brand fans were gone they were replicating a similar type of content but it just wasn't working um so we worked with them for a little while to basically be like right how can we make people love us again how can we reconnect mm -hmm. and um, i guess there are a few steps to it the first step to me and again I guess going back to that thin content that doesn't necessarily do much for you brand wise probably doesn't result in the most leads or sales but the really low barrier content that people can get involved with because when people comment and interact more people will see it which is great but also it provides them almost like it's the first day at the gym. Once you've done that, you've interacted once, when you see them again, it's easier to do so because you've you've had that initial touch point. I do this a lot on the PLM LinkedIn page, the Pretty Little Marketer LinkedIn page. Once a week, I'll do a really low barrier, really easy. Three reminders for social media managers. You are great. Likes suck. Elon Musk is the worst. Whatever those three reminders are, what would you add? What's number four? And that's a really loose example that's going to look different to everybody. But my first step when working with that brand, and I've done it before, re more recently too, is there's like low barrier. What can I do to make it just this? It's easy. It's not the best content, but it gets people through the doors. 
on the um I guess on the opposite side of that waiting for people to come to you is going to people so again whether it's on TikTok using that brand account to comment on relevant posts in your page or the same on LinkedIn as well how can you allow people externally to become familiar with you again so again not going to build the business too much but I feel like it's really important in your content rotation to have those posts that probably aren't going to make the most money or your ICP or your leads just those easy ones that again open the doors so finding easy ways to make people come to you hopefully interact and engage or if that's not happening we're going outward we're, we're joining the comment sections we're joining conversations and trying that approach um a hundred other steps but those would be my first initial trials i suppose that's perfect and uh, the 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 second point the one that i take from that the, the the sort of spirit behind it is that none of these things happen by accident or by themselves you know i think mm-hmm. that's been the promise of social media for so long is you post once you go viral profit oh god yeah no <laughs> <laughs> and it is that thing which is like elbow grease you know you turn up you show up you respond mm-hmm. uh part of the community etc cetera, etc cetera. that's how you build it up um mm-hmm. and, you know even examples such as duolingo which again i appreciate is a big brand but yeah. they show up they show up regularly um and and therefore they've built you know a real sort of momentum behind what they do um so yeah. Uh, thank you for that uh, not only for the examples and the direction but also the principles behind them because i think that's really useful um we've got venetia in the, the chat saying this is incredible learning so much so oh, so good. there we go <laughs> um we've got next one from anonymous uh, to move into a completely different space um who asks uh, about your go-to apps to manage your social um so trying to think about what I use I use Planable as a scheduling tool there are a scheduling and collaboration tool so scheduling wise Planable I use Dash Hudson a lot at the moment for social listening they have a really awesome tool on I think it's on their paid subscription called Vision AI that can give you the sentiment analysis of your comments what people think um, but also it will predict the uh, like engagement level of the post before it goes live based on your it's all very fancy so Planable um Dash Hudson, I use CapCut for all things video, Canva for all things static. I think that might be everything. I know some people have quite like a big tech stack, don't they, for they do, but not very techy, first of all. And if it's not simple, my brain will will shut shop. There will just be no existing. So um, Planable, Dash Hudson, CapCut, Canva um, would be, those are my four. Nice. That's perfect. So uh, I need to shout out two of those brands there. So Planable uh, today sponsored today's newsletter. So there's actually a resource in our uh, newsletter today from Planable. Um, I'd encourage folks to check out. And then likewise, Canva, you know, mm-hmm. it's just a changer. It's, it's been phenomenal. Um, so yeah, big, uh, big agreement there. Um, this next one's a big one, and I think Ao asked it earlier in in the chat as well. I, I saw it pop up in the chat, and uh, folks were asking about it, which is demonstrating the value of digital marketing, or or specifically social media, uh, in a way that bosses care about. Um, because I guess as we've spoken about things today, we've also reflected on stuff such as that conversation around the the quote unquote thinner content, and I don't yeah. think that's necessarily the right, right word to use all the time. Yeah. Um, and and how that might be a longer term play and all those sort of things. I mean, when you're going into these businesses, and I don't think you do quite as much freelancing as you used to, but um, when you're trying to justify the effort of your social media, how do you how do you begin to have those conversations? Yeah, I one thing I guess that is really comforting about questions like this, or even conversations like this, is that if you are in a company or you freelance and you're facing clients who don't get it you are absolutely not alone. And I think alongside many other things I love about the community here and just the marketing community in general, is that we're kind of, we're in it together and we get it and <laughs> we got each other's backs. Um, but yeah, no, absolutely. I have faced many times. I have brand, I have had brands come to me for consulting, previously social media management. You know, you're the expert, you do this. Okay, well, this is how it's going to happen. Well, no, 
we don't want it to happen like that. We want it to happen like that. We want this. We want that. We don't want that to happen. And I think the one thing I've learned, which I guess is pretty generic advice, again, it very much depends who you are, what you're doing and who that boss is, is really just trying to speak their language. What does social media mean to them, first of all? Because I feel like it's often really easy to like penalize someone for not getting it. Oh, we can't go viral overnight. What do you mean? Why is that what you want? But if that's their reflection of social media and they don't understand the full potential of it, then that is going to be that limitation. Um, so understanding like what is their goal with social media? What's your understanding of it? And then really speaking their language. So for a boss, why would they be interested in, in, in the social media? Well, brand awareness maybe it's sales maybe it's the future of their business and trying to level with them on that I did a webinar with Lisa Eaton from Fabric who's incredible um one or two years back now and she educates people in the B2B space she educates on strategy and um, she has like 10 years in the career on me maybe longer because she's been doing it amazingly for so long um and it was actually her recommendation to you know speak that language and, and find that shared what's the shared goal I want to do a good job you want brand awareness awesome well, let's do this. Failing that, I'm working with a brand at the moment whose marketing manager reached out and I'm running a workshop for them later this year. They were like, I want our bosses in the room because they won't listen to me. So maybe they'll listen to you, which right. breaks my heart. But equally, if you do have budget or there's someone you know who could externally come in to educate, it's almost that like blinkers bias, isn't it? Like, well, they're an expert, so maybe they'll listen to them. But language I think is number one if not I tend to cry but that doesn't get me <laughs> well you know and, and there is there is that element of it and you know we've, we've had plenty of folks over the course of time and I'm, I'm not suggesting that you would do this immediately on on this issue alone but sometimes you, you're just not working in the right environment where people are going to understand that Absolutely. there is those options that exist there um could you I, I think this is a really important point. Um, so I'd love to ask a follow-up question, which is like, when you find that middle ground between sort of someone's over here sort of saying sales and you're like, ah, you know, you know, it doesn't quite work like that. Have you got an example of a conversation where you've managed to bring people around to, to sort of go, ah, you know what, I do get it and here's the space to actually do what you need to do type of thing? Mm -hmm. Just be really angry. Yeah, it's so difficult, isn't it? I think a lot of it comes from a place of confidence and knowing that, like, I know this is what you want, but to my core, we cannot go viral overnight. We need two, three months to try or something new. Um, I don't think I have. I have been quite lucky. Well, luck is a subjective word, but always... I've never had huge pushback, I would say. What I do tend to do, it. I'm quite a practical person, so maybe my middle ground and the reason why there's never any no, Sophia, I will never do that. I really try and like logistically put a plan into place. So it's okay, you're here, I'm here. If we just have two months, here's what's going to happen rather than that fluff of, well, we need two months to, to see if it will work. And actually, if they can see okay, this is the next step and almost not heeding to it, but giving them something to monitor as well, creating a collaborative timeline. I'm going to try this for three weeks. We're going to have a meeting in four weeks. In our meeting in four weeks, we are going to look at the impressions. We're going to look at X, Y, Z. And I guess, yeah, setting like tangible touch points, mm -hmm. a plan. Yep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect you know I, if, if there's one thing that i want from this year is this year to be the year of internal communication for marxes you know mm -hmm. just to really prioritize those conversations because yeah. for the most part people aren't trying to not understand things it's just yeah. that they have time or the headspace so to be taking on that journey is is really really important so thank you and you know demonstrating a plan is is an excellent way to to do just that um We've got a three-word question next from Will, uh, who's just had to pop out, but um, it'll, it'll catch this in the recording, which is, is Twitter dying? <laughs> Good question. I am... Um... 
I was at an event um, in November and I was a speaker alongside Matt Navarra, who is one of my favorite people in our industry. He is like, he basically is like an industry insider. He has an incredible newsletter. He runs a community called Geek Out. And um, before my uh, session, he did a fireside with someone from the event and there were loads of questions about Twitter. Um, and he basically like, he hates, <laughs> he hates Twitter. And every time someone mentions you'd hear him like oh, not Twitter again it was really funny um so Matt had a or still has I think it was over a hundred thousand followers on Twitter now X he'd been on there for years all of his journalist marketing industry connections were on there and he actually made the decision late last year to come off it he no longer posts I don't know if he uses it casually but he no longer posts on X Twitter and now does threads Instagram ish and LinkedIn instead and for me, he's always been like almost my Twitter North Star. Like if Matt's on there, Matt uses it for the same reasons I would. So if it's alive and well to him, it's alive and well to me. So the second he was like, oh, over and out, it really made me think. Now, I have never really used Twitter for my business. I grew up. Uh, my teens were spent on Tumblr and Twitter. So I feel like I just have really toxic biases from my teenage days of just all of that horridness of Twitter. Um, but all that said, I don't think it's dead. I just think it's different. I think there are so many people out there who are such loyal, hardcore fans of Twitter. We look at brands like McDonald's, Wendy's, like Aldi. They thrive on there. And I think at least for now, they may be silly to give it up. Um, so ultimately, a marketing answer depends, doesn't it? I wouldn't build my personal brand on there, but if you were already established on there, equally, I wouldn't give it up. So I don't think it's dead. I wish it would die, but <laughs> right now, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's changing so regularly, though, as well, isn't it? So, you know, it's it's, uh, it's wrapped up in so much, and it can be quite a heated conversation for some Absolutely. folks, you know, um, but... You know, even Anastasia has just put something um, in there in the chat, you know, which is, I hate Twitter, you know, which is a, yeah. a fair moment, you know, it's a, it's a personal reflection and, and um, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's one that's charged with a lot of things. And I can imagine for folks who've built up an audience there uh, and really loved it, it could be really quite difficult uh, to, to move away from that. So it's a real shame what's happened there. Um, yeah. But there you go. You get Nick on the other side. He's, uh, I love it. It's like, so you get both sides of it. Yeah. Um, let's take the next question from Alicia. Uh, we've got seven minutes left. Um, so I just want to, um, once again, encourage folks, if there are any questions that you really want answering, then, uh, we've got to, uh, I'll, I'll just ask you to give it a thumbs up to make sure that we deliver the session that you want, uh, from today. Uh, so this question from Alicia, uh, says in addition to long, long form content format, what about podcasts? Are they still growing or are we more, uh, everyone has a, everyone and their mother has a podcast phase? I love this question. I think it really depends, like, again, it depends, but like, what are you using a podcast for? Mm -hmm. I would love to start PLM podcast. It's been a dream of mine for a while. Maybe I'll do it this year. Maybe I won't, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but for me, I wouldn't see a podcast as like a means of growth. It wouldn't, I don't want to top the industry charts, but it would be more of a community hub for loyal brand fans to, I don't know, hear me ramble about things they want me to talk about in a more accessible way that isn't a webinar or a paid event or whatever that could be so I think it very much depends like where does it fit in your content mix what's the point and is something else doing that for you already that said that I've seen a lot of predictions in uh, especially like the creator economy space that creators as they blow up and they enter like mainstream Alex all being an example of this Madeline Ar Argy, Argy um, signed to Alex Cooper's Unwell Network who now produces both of their podcasts Emma Chamberlain is a great example as well so I think creator and personal brand wise also a really great place to deepen relationships but I think I mean I don't think they're going anywhere I don't think they're going to anytime soon I don't think it's quite the boom it was a few years ago because it's not it's not new anymore we used to I think that's the only reason why we assume a plateau um but yeah it depends where why why do you want to sell podcasts what's the point and just making sure it fits logically I would say 
I love that. And, and thank you for reinforcing that point, because I think that's a really strong takeaway that folks can take from today's session is, you know, thinking about these platforms mm -hmm. in different, uh, rather than just doing a podcast, just doing a LinkedIn post, whatever it is, you know, having a clear purpose behind these things. It's exactly the type of thing that a decent marketing strategy should be thinking about when, when you're putting together your tactical plan. But yeah. I think, uh, we even do it at, at, at TMM, you know, where we'll sort of think, oh, okay, we need three posts this week. And we'll think about the post rather than the purpose first. Yeah. And sort of to switch that narrative around is, is so, so important. And particularly when interacting between the different platforms as well. So I just want to thank you for reinforcing that point because I think that's... Um, if, if social isn't your space, that's not necessarily an intuitive thing to do, uh, but I think it, it's really, really important. Um, I want to pick up on the second question from Alicia, because um, again, you know, we're, we're speaking in generic terms here about platforms and I appreciate it will be um, something for, everyone will have different things to take about this, um, but we haven't mentioned threads really today. And uh, that's, you know, of course it landed with a, a splash last year and then kind of, dissipated in my opinion but i have been seeing that you've carried on posting on threads so i'd love to know why you've continued doing that and um you know your general observations on threads yeah. in its total <laughs> um, so one thing you need to know about me is i'm very stubborn um so like when threads launched i was like threads is amazing everyone should be on it and I've committed to that now. So I will, <laughs> I will never give up. So first and foremost, I'm stubborn. And when I say that I like something and I'll do it, I will. But second of all, I think I struggle recommending threads because although as a user and I guess as a creator, someone that posts on there, I absolutely love it. I am equally incredibly fortunate, and I think the brands and individuals that thrive on that are too, that when they joined Threads, they already had a, a loyal group from Instagram ready and waiting to see them in a new format. So it was almost like, I don't know, adding a new room to your house. You already know it's going to be cozy, it's going to be good, you've already been there before. So I think a lot of my Threads enjoyment comes from that not necessarily biased, but I already have an audience who are bought into what I do. So when I do post, at least a few people see it, hopefully enjoy it, maybe respond. Whereas if you don't have that on Instagram, you're going to join threads, you're going to post, might be tumbleweed. And when you're not seeing that return, it's really hard to continue. So I, I guess it depends. If Instagram is your jam and it, your community over there is awesome, then threads will likely be somewhere you really enjoy as well. That said, I don't think it's a place to totally write off. Again, we're all about experimenting this year. Um, my feed on threads is always so conversational. It's not just about the hearts and the likes. Everyone replies to everyone. I've made some awesome connections over there. We don't even follow each other elsewhere, but like we'll just reply to each other's threads on threads. Um, so I guess again it comes back to like what am I using it for? If I'm expecting to blow up and have loads of community engagement, might be disappointed. But if I'm just there to connect with others and learn from them, maybe it could work. So yeah, it's hard because it's very it's just Instagram, but tech. So if you like Instagram. <laughs> before you um i don't think it's going to disappear anytime soon so yeah it's hard because it's new it's still a baby but those will be my best thoughts that's that's perfect you know and, and and that's all we can uh that's all we can ask you for so thank you very much uh sophie awesome. um folks we've come to uh our hour um i know that as part of uh sophie's strategy in the past then um she has taken questions from sessions like today and then sort of created content off the back of it. So what I'm going to do is create a document which I'm going to send to Sophie and she will have uh, 76 open questions uh, to, to, to create content. So I'd really encourage you to, uh, to, to follow Sophie because the content she's putting out is phenomenal. Um, likewise, I'm going to do the fancy thing as well. I just want to say a big thank you to our sponsors for today. It really means that we can bring these sessions to you for free. So thank you once again to Frontify, Exclaimer, Clavio, Redgate, Cambridge Marketing College, and maybe you one day. Um, and with all that said, uh, we'll be back next Tuesday uh, with Andy Lambert 
uh, speaking all about uh, how to build a social media strategy with a step-by-step -step guide. Uh, so if you would like to join that session, then it's two o'clock, it's free to join and uh, you'd be very, very welcome. Uh, Sophie, you're a freaking legend. Thank you very much for today. Um, it was so insightful, great examples, great resources. Um, your journey is just wonderful to watch. So congratulations on, on everything. And uh, thank you to the community as well. I can see bunches and bunches of really fabulous comments coming in. You're all appreciated more than you will ever know. Um, so thank you for making this first session of this year uh, truly special. Um, with all that said, I uh, hope to see you next week. And uh, in the meantime, have a cracking week.